I spoke on, on um, Sunday morning uh, about clinical epidemiology of young onset dementia, specifically young onset Alzheimer's disease, and how we define the syndromes, what those definitions mean for clinical practice, how to make the diagnosis, and then the implications for care and for future re research, for the future. And so firstly, we now um, know that compared to people who develop dementia after age 65 or who develop dementia, say, in their 80s, and those, those groups will be called, respectively, uh, typical onset or late onset versus oldest or old onset Alzheimer's disease. So those are the people 85 and older. The young onset dementia, the people who have young onset dementia differ from those two groups in a number of ways. Firstly, they tend not to have, they tend to have presentations of Alzheimer's disease that are less about memory and in fact very frequently are non-amnesic at all, um, are non-amnesic. Non and those presentations fall into five basic categories. So there are those who have um, aphasia. So they have trouble using language. They have trouble speaking, they have trouble understanding. So they have trouble with verbal communication. And that's not just in speaking, but it's also in writing. So, they, so it's a language impairment, not just, a, not, not just a, an articulation impairment. And then you have those with visual, visual, visual perceptual deficits. So these are people who have trouble with interpreting visual information. You have people with executive dysfunction and behavioral problems as the leading edge of the problem. And then you have those that we would call apraxic. So these are people who have trouble with skilled actions. So they have lost second nature be, um, ac actions. So for example, when one is driving, it's usually, you usually are thinking about something else. You're not consciously thinking to put the key, to turn the ignition and so on. So these people tend to lose basic skills, but, it, but at the level of, for example, not knowing how to put a shirt on. Now, it turns out that most of these other types of Alzheimer's disease presentations usually appear when people are in their 40s, 50s, or early 60s, whereas the memory impairments, people who have mainly memory problems, can develop, usually develop uh, dementia after age 65, although there are young onset people who, are mainly, who mainly have memory, and in that sense, their uh, condition resembles that of the older people. They, have, they are, however, a much smaller proportion in the young onset compared to the old onset. Now, it also happens that these atypical types that I was telling you about do happen in much older people, but they're very rare. So they're almost always young people. They tend to have, they tend to be more likely to be hereditary, although the majority, 70% of people with young onset dementia, do not have a hereditary dementia. It's a sporadic uh, dementia. Nevertheless, the majority, the hereditary, the, the mutations that cause dementia, that cause Alzheimer's disease, um, tend to express before the age of 60. They also, another difference um, is that when you do testing, you'll find that the, the um, test results from cognitive testing usually are narrow, uh, the abnormalities are mainly in that specific area of deficit, in contrast to the older onset people who have memory plus other impairments. These people tend to have very focal impairments. And that's also mirrored in the brain scans, where they have atrophy patterns that are specific to the areas of the brain that subserve the functions that they are, that, you know, that are impaired, that are specifically impaired in these phenotypes. So one implication for measurement is that the measurements that we use in dementia today were developed for Alzheimer's disease, assuming a global impairment in which memory is the most significant, is the earliest and most significant. And so it turns out that assumptions about how dementia progresses in young people that are based on using these instruments can be in error because people might have higher scores than you predict for the level of dysfunction that they experience in their everyday life, or they might have lower scores than you would predict from the way in which they present themselves. And that's because, for example, a person with aphasia that is sufficiently severe may still be independent in terms of driving, making choices, and so on, but they can't hold a conversation. But when you interview them, they have to produce their answers verbally. And so their scores are very poor on cognitive tests 
even though their competence in everyday life is high in the sense that they take care of themselves fully, they have an agenda, they're able to drive to where they're, they're able to drive themselves and, in, in, and, and participate, except that they are limited in their ability to exchange their ideas with others. Um, and so we, there is a need to develop new measures that reflect this problem. There is a need also um, to study the, how uh, these conditions present an opportunity basically to study how Alzheimer's disease seeds itself in the brain, if you will, and how it spreads through the brain as time passes. Now, we have many genetic very, um, uh, associations, quite apart from the hereditary mutations, of other, other gene loci have been linked to Alzheimer's disease, and it's possible that some of these ex exp uh, explain why some people develop it early and others later, why some people develop aphasia as opposed to memory impairment and so on. And so these atypical phenotypes therefore provide an op opportunity to understand how genes contribute various, to understand the various genetic contributions to the illness. And then re regarding treatment, uh, there are a number of things uh, that are, or regarding care, there are a number of big things. So the young onset people, for example, tend to develop the condition very often when they're still ra raising children. So that's a significant contributor to, to the, to the um, difficulty. They also may be losing employment as a, re as a result of this and they don't have retirement income until, until they get some sort of disability income, which of course depends on the jur jurisdiction in which they live and depends on what sort of uh, uh, benefits come with their job. And so there is, we have had for the observation in our clinics that sometimes people lose their jobs before it is, they know or anyone knows that they have dementia and very often there's no recourse. So that's an area of care that needs more attention. And then beyond that, uh, because they tend to be more able to be physically active and often are able to participate more in life than say an older person with dementia because they have a relative preservation of awareness of their problem uh, and, and uh, a relative preservation of their social ability. Um, they have needs in terms of supervision, in terms of recreational activities, uh, care activities I'm referring to, that are not always accommodated in the typical dementia care setups that we have today. And so there's, there's need for development in that area as well.